Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dan Hughes. I was the Nick Software webinar trainer from 2009 until 2014. Um, so through when Google actually purchased the Nick collection, and now I'm was given the opportunity to work with DxO uh, as the the new owners of the Nick collection, and I'm really excited to be able to do that. And they're doing some really interesting stuff with Upoint technology and with the Nick collection as they uh, continue to develop and um, update it so that it works on current and contemporary operating systems. Um, they've also integrated Upoint technology, so control points which we'll talk all about this entire webinar is basically about utilizing control points and different thought processes behind that. Um, but anyways, I'm, I was given the opportunity to do this webinar. I'm really excited about it. And uh, since leaving uh, Google from Nick Software, I, I moved on to another software company. And then I actually teach at the Rochester Institute of Technology. I teach photography at a university or at the university in the photography school at RIT. And I mention that because I'm actually sitting sitting in a tech lab, which is a highly technical lab that's designed for the photographic science students to learn all about photo science, how sensors work, how software and image processing works, how um, optics work, and so on and so forth. And I think it's really kind of interesting because uh, we, we are talking about Viveza 2, which basically is this really beautiful creative piece of software that it took about 100 engineers to actually build this piece of software, to make it intuitive, to make it work, and to make it so that you and I as creative photographers can just open up this software, place points on the objects that we want to adjust, and then basically tell the software what we want. And it, it takes this highly technical, very scientific thing and it makes it so we don't have to really think about that portion of the workflow. All we have to think about is what do we want our photograph to look like and then how do we approach and how do we make that happen? Anyways, uh, my name is Dan Hughes. I'll be taking you through this webinar uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And we're actually going to be starting with Photolab 2, which is a piece of software that is actually uh, bundled with the Nick Collection 2 by DxO, uh, and so if you if you don't have the plugins already and you buy the plugins, you actually will get this piece of software with the Nick Collection. And I I want to point it out because it's a raw processing tool that utilizes uh, optical and camera modules that optimize your your photographic editing, your post processing, to the camera and lens that you actually shot images with. I'm not gonna to talk too much about that, but I do wanna point out the fact that um, there are control points in here, and these control points, U-Point technology, actually utilize the raw information. And it's a dramatic and very important difference between utilizing um, Viveza and utilizing Photolab 2. So what I'm finding myself doing more and more often is actually using Photolab 2 as my initial raw processing software, using the, the different tools, I'm going to show you a couple of them here in Photolab, and then using control points to selectively do our post-processing with the raw data. Because if we're in Viveza 2, whether we launch from Adobe Lightroom, Adobe Photoshop, or Photolab 2, or some other piece of software, uh, you're actually not utilizing the raw information. You're you're duplicating the information as a as TIFFs or possibly JPEGs, which can be totally fine and yield fantastic results. But using it in Photolab 2, it's parametric image editing, which basically just means you can go back and redo stuff afterwards as many times as you might want because the control points are saved in there and you can go back and change those things. And then also you are dealing with the original raw information which should yield you a better result. Anyways, I've talked for seven minutes about um, just getting started. Let's actually talk about doing some post-processing on some fall time images. This first photograph is an image uh, that, that a friend of mine sent to me. Uh, he's a photographer who lives in Vermont, so he's got some really beautiful fall foliage images. And in this case, he's making an exposure, and uh, he's actually exposing, let's say, properly for the highlights in the clouds. And I, I want to point this out because there's a single checkbox, practically, here in Photo Lab 2, uh, that's called DxO Smart Lighting, over on the right side of the interface here. And by simply clicking this little box here on the right side, what this software does is it goes and tries to optimize the tones throughout the photograph for us. 
right? All I did was went and checked that thing on, and it went from um, this very underexposed representation of this scene to an image that has some texture and detail. And we can actually take that even further um, by clicking into the expand collapse box. So just clicking on the little triangle. I'm gonna do this quickly because I do wanna focus uh, the webinar on, on Viveza 2. But the thing is, is control points, and basically Viveza 2 is built into Photolab 2. And I find myself doing this, so I wanna sort of present that to you guys as well. So um, what I went and did as I was talking is I changed my mode to uh, medium and then I adjusted my intensity to about 47. And now what we've got out of the image is a lot more texture and detail. Another thing that's happening, I think the image might have been shot from a window. You can actually see in the upper left corner there's uh, some, some problem or issue or something going on up here. So what we're going to do is move into the crop tool and I'm just going to go from um, an auto crop to uh, my own custom crop, and I'm just gonna go ahead and crop this down a little bit, just because the important parts of the photograph um, are probably down a little bit further. We're gonna leave the original ratio, uh, the two by three ratio, and just crop that in. Now, from there, I'm gonna move into the upper portion of the interface and click into the local adjustments. As I do this, if you have any questions or comments or concerns or anything like that, feel free to type them into the questions box. As we transition from one image to another, I'll take a look at the questions and see what's going on in there. Um, anyways, I clicked on the local adjustments tool and uh, this is gonna give us an opportunity to talk about control points. And these control points work almost exactly the same way as they do within Viveza 2, except again, like I said, we're dealing with the raw data. So what I'm gonna do here is just start placing a point on the object that I want to adjust and I'm gonna size the area of influence around the object. And what this control point is doing is actually making a selection of uh, those red leaves that we've put the place or placed the control point on. It is not necessarily making a circular selection, but making a selection inside of that circle. It's called the area of influence. And it's basically the, the indicator to the software as to how big or small this object is that we wanna be adjusting. And what it does, the software looks this control point specifically, looks for the similar tones, colors, and textures, and attempts to just select out that object that we've placed the point on. Uh, built into each one of these control points, uh, you have basically three different modes, three different sections. You have your kind of contrast, your light as it's called, your color adjustments, and then some sharpness or detail adjustments as well. And you can, you can toggle between each of those individual sort of sets of tools each and every control point in Photolab 2 has this kind of set of adjustments. And in here, we can go into the light, which is our exposure. I can maybe bring that exposure up. I'm gonna increase the contrast a little bit. I like micro contrast in this situation, and I'm gonna go ahead and bring some clear view plus into it. Now, what we've got going on in here, as I size my area of influence, you can actually see kind of instantly as the size of the area of influence changes, uh, exactly what's being adjusted and what's not being adjusted. Now, one thing that's happening here is this control point is affecting the grass a little bit. Probably if I take the point and place it maybe on a, a more saturated warm tone, it's not gonna do that as much. But if I don't want the control point to be adjusting something, I can go into this little minus control point section here. So this is going to be a protective control point Click on that, you can see how it, we went from a standard control point to a minus control point, it's highlighted in blue. And I can just place a minus control point there in the background. And what this is doing is it's saying, this control point, the initial one that we made the adjustments on, will adjust those tones, colors, and textures. And then this minus control point is basically going to be a protective control point. And I point that out because it does work in a slightly different way uh, in Viveza. So the, the software works in a slightly different way. Now, uh, I'm gonna just add one more control point. In this case, I'm gonna just clean up the color that's occurring in the background here. It's a little bit warm in my mind. And I guess another benefit, I, sh I shouldn't say I guess, because this is a major benefit, uh, is that because we're dealing with the raw data, we can actually go in and, and do custom color white balances in different parts of the photograph. We're actually using the white balance data and information from the raw, and I can selectively go in and change the color 
using our color adjustments. And in the color adjustments, you've got vibrancy, saturation, your temperature, tint, and then even a hue adjustment. So we can even go in and skew the hue of the uh, the tree in the background. And and this is really important again because it offers a completely different kind of control than basically any other piece of software out there. You have viewpoint technology to make these selections for you, and then you have the capability of adjusting all of these different things in the raw process. All right, we're gonna come back to PhotoLab 2. I'm gonna close that for now, so I'll click the close button. Let's just take a gander at the before and after. Here's the original image. Again, you know, this is a good example image to, to display the uh, DxO smart lighting. It's a beautiful photograph. It's exposed for those clouds in the background. And then we can use this post-processing adjustment stuff to uh, basically go in and mas massage the tones nicely. And the software, the, because of the way that PhotoLab works, the software is going to retain a lot of texture and detail for us. I don't think we even need to do really any noise reduction um, I'm zoomed into 120%, and if we if we sort of I'm going to let this render for a second. You can see that it's a relatively short depth of field that's that's being uh, this is being imaged with, but it's really pretty incredible. We're going from almost no tone and exposure in the original exposure into something that has this nice sort of um, ethereal effect to it. Anyways, let's jump into the next picture. In the next photo, I've actually already cropped this image and I've kind of adjusted it the, the way I want as a starting point. And um, I'm gonna walk you through sort of my mindset when utilizing something like Viveza 2. Um, and this approach is more of an approach for, let's say an Adobe Lightroom or a Photoshop user. And that is, I would use the raw processing software to do all of my global adjustments. So I've kind of set up the image where I think I want it to be globally. And uh, I'm going to actually make sure that this is on a little bit more. I want my DxO smart lighting on a little bit more. And then we're just going to take this image from PhotoLab 2 over into Photoshop so that I can talk to you about launching the software from Photoshop. And we actually take a look at Viveza 2 because that's what we want to be getting into specifically in this webinar. Okay, or at least that's my my sort of thought process. So we've got our image. Uh, we could launch into the Nick collection from PhotoLab 2 if we move into the lower right corner of the interface. We'll do that later in the webinar. For now, what we're gonna do is move to the far lower right corner of the customized section. And there's a little box that has an arrow that's pointing up. I'm gonna click on that. And then I'm just gonna say, um, export to Photoshop, which it's not gonna let me do that, which is surprising because, um, the last time I used the software, it did let me do that. So I'm gonna say export to application. Apparently my Photoshop isn't loaded. Uh, there we go. It was my my Lightroom apparently is preloaded in there, but my Photoshop isn't. So just to reiterate, I've clicked on the uh, the box in the far lower right corner. I'm gonna say export to application, and then uh, in this case my Photoshop just comes up on its own because that's what's loaded in my export to application option. Here's where you would tell PhotoLab 2, exactly how you want to export your image from PhotoLab into Photoshop. And th these are the settings that I'm going to stick with for now, and we're not going to talk too much about them, but you, you would change these depending upon what you're doing and where you're taking uh, your image from PhotoLab into, let's say, Photoshop or another application. In this case, I want to retain as much information as possible, so I'm going to leave this a TIFF file, and I'm going to leave this 16-bit. If I were to change this to 8-bit, or if I were to change this to JPEG, um, or some other file format, I'm, I'm going to get a different image quality out of it. Uh, and I'm gonna leave this at this high image quality sort of set of settings. So I'm gonna click export. The software is then going to duplicate this raw file and it, it will export the TIFF file from PhotoLab 2 into Photoshop. And so what we're gonna be able to do here is access the NIC collection from Photoshop uh, so that we can kind of walk through that process as we haven't even opened the NIC collection yet. Now, here in Photoshop, we can access the software a couple different ways. You can use the NIC selective tool, and this is how you would access any or all of the NIC plugins from Photoshop. Uh, and there's some nice little bells and whistles that are built into the NIC selective tool. So I, I actually leave this up on my Photoshop interface all of the time uh, because I've actually gone in, especially with let's say color effects, and set some favorite filters and even some favorite recipes. Right. 
So, uh, I, and so oftentimes I want to go in and just use pro contrast or launch the software directly into a pro contrast filter. Um, that's why I'm going to use the Nick collection or sorry, the, the Nick selective tool there. Uh, the other way to open up into the Nick collection from Photoshop is to go to the top part of the interface, go to the filter drop down menu, and then move into the Nick collection dialog. And so you can access the, the Nick collection here as well. Uh, one of the things that I like about the Nick Selective tool as well, you'll, you'll notice the order is actually different here in the filter drop-down menu. This is in alphabetical order, and then the order that's in the Nick Selective tool is kind of the order that's a suggested workflow of the Nick collection. Uh, that is, oftentimes if you're going to use noise reduction, you're going to do that very early in the process, and then you might use something like Viveza 2 to do your light and color editing with control points, and then maybe into color effects, and then Sharpener Pro, or something like that. So that's the that's the rationale behind uh, why the Nick Selective tool is in that order. Now, let's go ahead and click right into Viveza 2, and as that software launches, I want to take a look at our GoToWebinar control panel, to make sure everybody's still good to go and we're not having any sort of audio problems or anything like that. Okay, uh, one one good question, right, so there's a bunch of good questions that are coming in, one in regards to image quality and retaining detail and texture. Phil, Victor, I'll, I'll talk about that at the end of the webinar. Good question, uh, but one question in regards to the Nick Selective tool is can you dock the Nick Selective tool into one of the other Photoshop panels? No, uh, George, not at this point. That would be a really nice feature. I'm not sure why, you know, that that isn't something that's been done, uh, but it's a, basically a floating palette. And what you can do is minimize it. I don't think I can do it now because I have the Nick software open. But if you click on the little minimize button, it just makes it into this little selective tool bar. So at least it's hidden away a little bit more. Um, for usually, so I'm coming to you from a laptop. And so I only have one monitor. Uh, in a perfect world, I would be editing and doing these webinars on two monitors, and in which case I would have sort of a palette monitor and then my image area monitor, in which case you, you will have enough um, sort of space to kind of keep that Nick Selective tool open. Uh, I tend to keep the Nick Selective tool open anyways because I use the software all the time. Now, we're here in Viveza 2. The first thing that I want to point out is the fact that these control points, so we use control points in Photo Lab 2, and I, I am speaking to everybody in the webinar. Obviously, there's there's a whole gamut of folks from kind of Nick software experts and people who've been using it for years to people who've probably never even opened the software before. So uh, some of this stuff might be a little bit redundant if you've been using the software a long time. But for those of you who are brand new, control points are built into, in some form, they are built into every one of the Nick plugins. Here in Viveza 2, it's sort of the first and foremost tool, so you found, find it on the right side of the interface, right at the top. Now, underneath the Add Control Point button and your two grouping buttons, you also have a set of sliders. And right now, the set of sliders inform you that if we make an adjustment to a slider, it's going to be global, which basically means if I take a contrast slider and I slide that to the right, I'm going to be increasing the contrast on the entire photograph. It's a global adjustment. When we move in and start using control points, that actual, the term there, global, is gonna to switch to selective, right? And that's because we're going to be working in a particular area or on a, a wow, particular object in the image. And so that's kind of an important thing to think about uh, because that's gonna change and you wanna sort of take note of that. So um, in my raw processing, I've already basically adjusted the image, although I think my color balance is a little bit off. I probably could have warmed the whole image up. I definitely should do that in my raw processing and my raw editing. But if I needed to, we could also do that here. I'm gonna warm the entire image up with the global adjustment. That's too far, I'm gonna bring this up. So the the result here is going to be slightly different because I'm not actually dealing with the color balance. I'm dealing with uh, warmth, red, green, and blue sliders. And so the, the resulting effect is slightly different. I, I definitely should have changed my white balance while we were in photo lab. I skipped that step, which was sort of foolish. Uh, now, control points. Using control points in Viveza 2, 
By the way, I'm going to talk to you about all of the different parts of the interface in the next few minutes. But the most important part of um, utilizing Viveza, and for that matter, in my mind, any of the NIC collection, uh, whether you're using you're, you're editing or doing post-processing on images of the from autumn or a portrait or images in the midwinter or whatever. Uh, using these control points allow you to call out objects and areas in an image and then basically just tell the software what you want to do with that area. For example, these trees here are um, without a little bit of detail. And I want to bring a little more detail into those uh, those trees. So I'm going to place a control point on the object, and then I'm going to size my area of influence so that I'm just encompassing the object that I really want to um, affect and control with this one particular control point. And then each control point here in Viveza 2 uh, has brightness adjustments, contrast, saturation, structure, shadow adjustments, warmth, red, green, blue, and hue. If you open your software and you don't have all of those sliders, what's happening is, uh, in, in the first time you ever open the software, this is what's gonna happen. The control points are sort of limited to um, brightness, contrast, saturation, and structure until you click on the little triangle that's uh, underneath the control point itself. Or, if you follow me back to the right side of the interface, Notice uh, I only have brightness, contrast, saturation, and structure. If I move to uh, the, the button in the far upper right corner of this section, I can expand to all my sliders. And the idea here is just if you don't need to have those sliders open, it gives you a slightly cleaner interface. It's easier to see what's going on around. But if you want to be able to control all aspects, you can expand all of those sliders down. Also notice it, it doesn't say global on the right side anymore. It says selective. So if I go into my control point and I maybe adjust my shadow adjustments, maybe I bring out a little more detail in that area, and then uh, let's actually remove some blue, you'll notice as I slide the sliders around on the control point, uh, it's actually sliding the sliders around on the right side of the interface as well. So the, the benefit here is you can use the sliders that's uh, in this specific control point or while this control point is active and the sliders are out, you can actually use the sliders on the right side of the interface and whatever you do is going to be reflected in that particular control point. So that's kind of an important thing to think about because it might be easier to actually use the sliders on the right or to specifically highlight the number and type in a different number. Like if I wanted 10% shadow adjustments, I just click on the number, type it in, and then um, I can basically make sure I get that particular number. There's 45% as I hit enter, and that's good to go. Uh, so I've got a little more detail on the trees. I want this exact effect to sort of be replicated in our other tree over here. So what I'm going to do is duplicate this control point, and I'm going to place it over here in this control point. And then once we have a handle on control points, I want to talk to you about at least my thought process on doing post-processing on photographs of autumn, or for that matter, really any kind of photograph, because my approach is kind of the same no matter the subject. Uh, it, of course, the intention of the photograph is going to be different, but in my mind, the, the job of this post-processing is obviously you get the best picture you can in camera, and then you use the post-processing to direct the viewer's attention and to hold the viewer's attention. And we can do that very quickly and easily with these control points um, using kind of standard design elements. And the most important one that I think we're going to talk about today is uh, using the color adjustment tools to create what's called a kind of checkerboarding effect. Uh, and to, to do that here in Viveza 2, I'm going to leave some areas a little bit cool. And I'm going to take other control points and I'm going to warm up these different areas. And what this should do is create this really wonderful sense of depth and form in the image. And again, the beauty here is I don't have to worry about making individual selections of all of these objects and areas. All I've got to do is place the point on the object that I want to adjust and then make my adjustment. So in this case, and with these sort of autumn-esque images, I am going to be utilizing the red, green, and blue sliders a lot. And just to kind of explain what's happening, I'm going to place a point here on this sort of central set of trees. And the, the trees themselves 
are a little bit cool and I want them to be warmer and I want them to be less blue, right? So what we'll do is with these sliders uh, is basically remove this, the colors we don't want, therefore adding the colors that we probably do want. So uh, the way it works with red, green, and blue. The blue slider, if you slide that slider to the right, it's going to be increasing the blue, therefore decreasing yellow. If I uh, go in and I remove blue, I'm going to be decreasing the blue, but I'm going to be also increasing the yellow and making this area more vibrant, and it's going to stick off of these other objects that are a little bit cooler, like these evergreen trees over here. So I've just removed the blue, I'm gonna actually add a little bit of magenta. So by removing green, I would be adding some magenta. I don't wanna to do too much because I don't wanna really change the color of the tree. I just wanna make them a little bit more vibrant. Uh, and then I can go into my red slider and by, uh, I can remove red, which is going to add cyan, right? It basically completely changes the color of our tree in that case. Um, or I can move into my red and maybe add just a few points red. And what this is gonna get out of this is this nice warm tone. Now, you could do that with the warmth slider. So you could actually just take this warmth slider, slide it to the right, it's gonna warm it up. But you're gonna get a different kind of control out of your individual red, green, and blue sliders. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of tackle those first in my mind to kind of balance out the color the way I want it to be. And I wanna attract your eye as the viewer to these beautiful, vibrant trees. So I'm going to increase the structure which is basically a texture adjustment. We'll talk more about that. And then I'm gonna also increase a little bit of contrast with those control points. So the human eye is going to be attracted to uh, the brightest, most saturated and vibrant, and the highest contrast areas of an image. And your eye is going to get pushed away from the areas that are maybe not as sharp, not as bright, and lower contrast. And we can take advantage of these things, especially with an image like this that has this foreground, middle ground, and background. And we can really direct the viewer's attention through the image very quickly and easily uh, by simply adding these points and then increasing or decreasing the adjustments we need. So uh, in this case, these, this section of trees is a little bit more red than it is yellow. So I'm gonna actually add a little more red there maybe 15%, 18% red, remove a little bit of blue. It's gonna give us this nice vibrant color. Increase the saturation and structure just a touch. And I, the, the beauty of doing, making these adjustments this way is I don't have to just take this saturation slider over to 100, right? That looks crazy, it's not natural, it doesn't work. We could maybe increase the saturation a little bit, but I don't think we even need to because we're able to balance out these colors uh, or I'll leave it at 7%. We're able to balance out these colors. And if we play our cards right, and we place control points on the areas that we want to retain a little bit more of a cool area in effect, and then maybe increase the warmth and the, the color range of those warmer tones, um, basically we're gonna get this really beautiful sort of separation. And then this really wonderful uh, a way of controlling the image that both looks natural and then also is dramatically different than, than maybe the initial capture. So uh, one of the problems that we run into with, with digital capture, with these wonderful cameras that we have, is that we're, we're shooting this raw data and it kind of gives us this linear effect. Uh, that is, it, the software or the, the engineers that develop these cameras are attempting to give us as much clean information as possible. And of course, that's what we want. But the problem that we run into then is that it, the images are oftentimes relatively flat and we need to go in and uh, massage the tones and textures to, to really get what we want out of the image. And uh, these U point, these control points, really allow us to do this very easily. So I'm gonna go and cool the foreground down a little bit. Let's actually increase the blue just a touch in the foreground. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just darken down these tones a little bit. And that's gonna, again, direct your attention towards those trees a little bit more. Uh, let's take a control point. And here's the thing about this. I could probably sit here on this image for the entire day and talk, a, not literally the entire day, but probably a, a quite a long time. And we could talk about the different approach and the, the direction that we can take and each control points, adjustments. 
um, to get exactly what we want to direct the viewer's attention. But I, I think that we need to continue moving forward. So I'm just going to drop a couple more control points. I love the kind of misty background that we have back here. We have this really wonderful um, sort of haze that's occurring in the distance back there in the background. So I'm going to leave that, uh, maybe even increase it a little bit by taking the blue slider, just increasing a little bit of blue, and then going into the red slider and decreasing a little bit of red. That's going to make that background a little bit more blue. And then I'm, I am going to increase the structure just a little bit. If we take it to 100%, you can really see what the software does. So structure is basically a texture adjustment. It, what it's trying to do is go in and look for those little objects and areas and delineate them more, kind of like sharpen the edges and areas a little bit more uh, so that we get more texture out of that background in this case. I don't want too much because I want to leave that kind of hazy background, but by increasing it a little bit, I think we're going to get a little more form and depth out of it. Uh, to duplicate this control point, I'm going to hold down the Option key on my Mac, or if I was on a PC, I would hold down the Alt key. And while I'm holding down Option or Alt, you click on the control point and drag your duplicate control point away. So it's Option, click, and drag. And this is going to give us an exact duplicate of these control points. And now we've got this really nice kind of cool background, this nice warm foreground or, or midground. And then uh, we started to kind of go in and control the foreground a little bit. Uh, now that we've made some adjustments on the photo photograph, let's just take a quick look at the before and after. In fact, to do that, you'll follow me to the upper left corner of the interface. We have three different views here in Viveza 2, and for that matter, in any of the NIC um, collection, in any of the NIC tools. Uh, you have your single image view, and we can turn our little preview checkbox on and off. There's the original image. There's the enhanced image. We sort of created that checkerboarding effect. Uh, we have a split preview, so on the left is the original, on the right is the enhanced, and you can click on the uh, slider there in the middle, and we can kind of direct that back and forth so that you can, uh, and this is handy, especially if you're zoomed into an image and you really wanna see what that before and after looks like. Uh, you know, we're not actually zoomed in right now, but if we wanted to, we can just hit the Command or Control Plus, it's Command Plus on a Mac, Control Plus on a PC. Uh, and zoom in a couple times. So now we're zoomed into 100%. And now as I slide this back and forth, I can get a real nice sense of exactly what's being adjusted and affected and um, exactly what's happening on the image. We'll talk more about how these control points are making their selections in the next uh, few images as well. Uh, I'm gonna zoom out. So I'm gonna hit Command-0. That gives us a full screen view. And I've actually already switched into a side-by-side -side preview. On top is the original image, on the bottom is the enhanced image. If I uh, click on the little twirler or spinning tool here in between, on the left is the original, on the right is the enhanced, and uh, that's that. I'm gonna keep moving so we can talk about some different photographs. And I wanna talk, I click the OK button by the way in the lower right corner. That's gonna bring us back over into Photoshop. And in Photoshop, what's happening is we have generated a new layer of pixels. So we've got our original image, and then our enhanced image. I think I actually made a little bit of a mistake on this photograph. I should have used the white balance tool in, uh, in Photo Lab 2 before bringing the image over here into Photoshop. I think we would have gotten a, a nicer result. But anyways, using Viveza 2, we go from here to there. I'm into it, looks good. Let's jump into the next photograph. Uh, this is another photo by my friend Lori Rubin. Uh, Lori Rubin uh, and I worked together at Nick Software for many years, and she is also working with DxO um, with the Nick collection. And I'm very excited uh, that she's going to be helping out with um, all of the, the, the great things that they're going to be doing. Um, I, I tend so because I'm working at RIT, I'm, I'm basically doing webinars for them. Um, and so I don't hear much about exactly what's happening with the software itself, unfortunately. But uh, as soon as it happens, then, then I get the news. It's really kind of exciting. So anyways, we're here in Photoshop. We're switching into this next image. Uh, I'm happy with the initial raw image. Let's go ahead and just click right on to Viveza 2. I'm going to open up that go to webinar control panel to just make sure we don't have any problems. Um, cool. Nope, there don't seem to be any issues going on. That's wonderful. And I'm going to switch in the upper left-hand corner back into a, my single image view. It's going to give our image the sort of most real estate possible. Uh, we did have a question about where were these images shot. I, I want to say these are in the Sierra Nevadas. 
uh, in California, I think. I'm I'm saying that because I I remember Lori talking about these photos before she provided them to me, uh, but I I can't remember exactly where they are and I apologize. But really beautiful light in here and we've got this this sort of checkerboarding effect. So this is a common sort of theme that you'll see in all sorts of really beautiful photographs and you could be doing this consciously or maybe unconsciously you get some images that that work this way but the checkerboard effect that i'm talking about there's there's other terms for that is where you have these light tones that transition to dark that transition to light that transition to dark and so on so you're seeing that here in the foreground especially right so light tone to dark tone to light tone to dark tone to light tone and so on and and this is going to help create depth in an image and interest and even more than that it helps the viewer have different things and different tones to look at, right? If if the light in this image was just flat and there weren't these nice sort of modulated shadows going into the image, uh, or this was fully illuminated and so was this area, there would be less interest between the shadow and the, the highlight sections. And so this is a, a really wonderful thing to look for in the environment that you're shooting, or if you're manufacturing your own photographs, to use this sort of technique um, to, to generate and create more interesting, more compelling photographs by controlling the light. Now, of course, what we can do in the post process is take that to 11, if you will, or we can you know, keep it subdued and relatively subtle. Right now, this image is actually a, a, a little uh, lower contrast than I think it should be. So uh, rather than using just control points and maybe these global adjustment sliders, uh, we can move into our levels and curve so on the right side of our Viveza interface, and uh, for anyone not familiar with a level and curve adjustment, um, the level adjustment tool that you have in here would, would be these three tools, right? So these little indicators here, you're able to basically take your shadows and make them darker, or if you want, you can actually make them brighter by going into the curve. Now, while you do that, uh, if I take this curve and I bring it up, now I don't have a really brilliant D-Max. I don't have a very dark black, right? And so I do want to be careful doing that unless I want a muted kind of image, which is definitely a look and feel. Totally works. I don't know, and it probably would work for all sorts of fall time images, but in this case, I don't think we want to bring that texture, or sort of, uh, sorry, we, we don't want to globally bring out all of those shadow details and brighten them up. I, I don't think that it's going to, improve or uh, yield impact on the image. What we want to do here, in my mind, is to minimize distractions and maximize impact. So to do that, I'm going to drop a control point up near the highlight area, which by the way, again, for people not familiar, the shadows are going to be here on the left, the highlights are going to be here on the right. You can adjust the level itself, so we can sort of pull that in. Uh, or we can go in with a curve and actually drop controls, or not control points, they're not control points, but you can drop points onto your curve and you can create any kind of curve you might want to. By dragging the curve upward, it's going to brighten the image. By dragging the curve downward, you're going to darken the image. And depending upon where you place those points, you're going to be increasing or decreasing the contrast in particular areas of the histogram or rather particular um, tonal values in the image. So we, this is a tool that we could talk about for hours and hours. If you're not terribly familiar with the curve tool, um, definitely jump, you know, after the webinar, jump onto YouTube and look up, you know, levels and curves adjustment tools. What will likely come up are Photoshop um, inter interface YouTube videos, but the tools work almost the same way. If you, if you get and understand and utilize these concepts, um, in Photoshop, it works the same way here, or let's say in Lightroom, if you're a Lightroom user, uh, works the same way here. So it's just a nice little added way of working. Now, as we do this, we're dealing with the RGB curve. So that's the red, green, blue curve. So it's adjusting everything at once. If you click on your levels and curve drop down menu, you can actually control each of these individually as well. We are going to do that, but not in a curve. We're going to do it with control points. Now, um, for just a second here, I'm just going to lean back in my chair and I want to kind of assess the photo. That is, I want to figure out where I want to direct your eye to and where I want to pull your eye from, right? And so in some situations, 
like this shadow up here, and this isn't probably the most important thing, but this shadow is not the most important area. And I think that it's it's a little bit brighter than it needs to be. I wanna create some contrast in that area. So I'm gonna place this point, and I'm gonna go ahead and just take my brightness slider to the left and darken that area down. If I take it too far, it's gonna to go totally black. And now it's not really going to fit the contrast range of the entire image. So it doesn't make sense to do that. But uh, what I definitely want to do is darken that down, burn that area down, maybe 20% or so, and then add just a little bit of contrast into that area. We can actually double click to zoom in so we can see a little bit better as to what's happening here. And as I add a little bit of contrast, now the range looks good and those tones, there's still detail in there, but it's not, it's not that bright. In fact, I'm going to click on this control point and drag it away. So you can see the original, there you go, as it renders. And so it's it's not the nicest value. I wanna sort of push your eye away, but I still wanna retain a little texture. So I'm gonna place that point in there, drop down the brightness, increase a little contrast. And now what we've done is actually kind of increase the contrast range of this entire area. And by doing that, it attracts your eye as the viewer into that area because we have the highlight here and we've got the shadow there. Now to, get to know control points a little bit more. If you follow my cursor over to the right side, we have our control points list, and I can toggle uh, an actual mask on and off. And what you're seeing as I click that little checkbox on the far right of the control point list is anything that is white is being controlled and adjusted by this control point. Anything that's black, let's say like out here, is not being affected, and then anything that is a shade of gray is being affected, and the lighter the gray, the more the effect that this control point has, right? If I click and drag this control point over to a different area, you'll actually see as the selection changes. And it's very, it's really smart, super intuitive. If I place the point here on the edge, what the control points want to do is not necessarily cut stuff out like maybe a lasso tool or a, a brush tool, right? That's a completely different way of making a selection. What the control points want to do is make a photographic looking selection where when you start making your adjustments, they are going to yield you a photographic looking effect. And in that way, you don't have to do nearly as much work and you're still going to yield a result that's going to be very pleasing and really beautiful. Now, uh, when we were in Photo Lab 2 earlier in the presentation, I showed you that the control points there had sort of these adjustment points where you could adjust all of those sliders. And then there were also uh, protective control points, or otherwise known as maybe a minus control point. Uh, Viveza 2 has something similar, but rather than having two different kinds of points, uh, you basically would just take another control point and you would place the point uh, on the object that's being adjusted by the, let's say, first control point that you don't want adjusted. Meaning if I wanted to protect this area from this control point, I would take another control point, place it in there, and you should see it change just a little bit. And what's happening now is these control points are starting to communicate with each other. This point knows and understands that it should be controlling these tones, colors, and textures. And this control point now knows better what it should be affecting, right? So by adding more and more control points, each control point actually gets smarter, right? And if I go ahead and size my area of influence, you'll actually see as the control point kind of uh, encompasses a different area and therefore selects a slightly different area. I don't, I'm gonna double click here to zoom out. I don't find myself using um, this feature all that often. I, I do to check to, to see like if there's an area that's being affected that I really don't want affected by a particular control point. But I find myself kind of just turning control points on and off. That is using the checkbox that's on the left side of the control points list. I, I usually will just turn them on and off and make sure when I'm zoomed out or when I'm zoomed in that the effect is where I want it to be and it's exactly what I want it to be doing. And, and so in that way, I'm working in a precise manner, but I'm not completely obsessed with how the masks are being generated and exactly what they're affecting, right? And in this way, I can also work in this really beautiful intuitive way, right? So uh, we, we kind of talked about the fact that we, there's you know, 100 engineers, literally at least 99 engineers were working at Nick Software at the time that this was developed. Um, 
they they spent all of their time trying to figure out how to make this software as intuitive and easy to use as quickly as possible so you don't have to think about making selections and you don't have to worry about um, any of that process. All you have to do is drop the control point on the area that you want to adjust, go into the slider, and then make the adjustment. Right, And in this way, it, it basically offers the creative uh, less thinking about the technical and more thinking about what you want the result to actually be. Uh, by, by using some design elements, we're able to control these images really quickly and easily with the control points. I can direct your eye as the viewer, and I can actually, let's go ahead and add a little cool, some, some green into these evergreen trees that are looking a little bit warm. Um, but I can basically direct your eye as the viewer through the image without really having to worry about uh, making selections, with, without thinking about anything. I literally just say, okay, this area needs to be brighter, this area needs to be warmer, this area needs to attract your eye, so I'm going to add some structure. And, and basically we're able to control the photos really quickly and easily. Uh, I'm not sure if, if you guys could hear that. I'm, I, like I said before, I was in, I'm in a lab, in a photo lab at RIT. A bunch of students just walked by laughing really loud, so I apologize if that was distracting. Kind of got me distracted. So um, now, it's uh, 1049. I, of course, have talked your ear off this entire time about how to use uh, the, the control points and how to use Viveza 2. We really haven't talked all that much about controlling these images of, of uh, fall. Although what we are attempting to do as we take a look at this before and after is direct the viewer's attention. So here's the before. Actually, let's look at the side-by-side -side preview. So relatively small. I'm going to hide the palette on the right side. On the left side of the, uh, the interface here, you see the original image. On the right side, you see the enhanced image that we've created here within Viveza 2 to, again, direct the viewer's attention through the image, minimize distractions, maximize impact. I'm, I'm going to say we're done editing on this photo, so I'm going to click the OK button. That's going to bring us back over into Photoshop. I want to jump back into Photo Lab 2 because I want to sort of talk more about doing some post-processing on our autumn images and things to maybe think about. But but the, the real takeaway here is utilizing control points, I would say in Viveza 2 or in Photo Lab 2, to uh, direct the viewer's attention around the photograph. In fact, let's jump into this image. So this is a photograph that, um, you know, it's basically my friend Kevin Young is out in the woods in the Adirondacks, I, I believe in 2017, and he's, he's just sort of shooting some snapshots. And I think he came away with a really beautiful image here. Um, the, I believe he had an auto white balance on, and so I need to definitely go in and control my white balance a little bit. Uh, to, to warm this up a touch. And so what we're going to do is move into the white balance. I do want to talk about control points here. And when I, what I find with this image, as I warm this up, uh, I, I actually think that warming the image by sliding that temperature and tint slider too far to the right looks better on the leaves. But now the, uh, the birch tree here that's in shadow, I'm pretty sure that's a white birch, uh, is, is magenta. It's the wrong color in my mind. I think that that should be neutral. So what we'll do is use control points exactly the same way as we did within Viveza, but in this case, doing it in Photolab. Uh, but I'm going to utilize the white balance tool sliders that are built into the control points here in Viveza, or here in Photolab, rather. So um, I've clicked onto the local adjustments, in case you missed that. Uh, by the way, there are more local adjustment tools than just control points built into Photolab 2. I focus on control points because it's what I tend to gravitate towards in my own post-processing uh, because they're beautiful and they make these beautifully photographic selections. But in some situations, you might want to use a gradient or you might want to brush the effect in or out, in which case, and there's an auto mask as well, which is like an edge detection brush, really cool stuff. So... Uh, in, in my case, to, to access this, I didn't mention how to do that. When I've clicked into local adjustments, if you right click on uh, the image somewhere, you can actually just scroll over this kind of heads up display that pops up. And then in the middle of the heads up display, you're able to see what the button is going to do. You can reset something, you can add a new mask, you can use your brush and so on and so forth. In our case, we're using control points. 
So I'm going to place my control point. I'm not going to size the area of influence first. Usually I would, but just to show you what's happening here, we're already in the color uh, module or the color set of tools within this control point. And what I want to do is, is warm this back up and basically neutralize the tree. So I want it to be uh, not completely neutral. I've, I've actually warmed it up too much. But I don't want it to be as, as sort of magenta and cool as it was. Now, as I've sized the area of influence to basically fit the tree, and I want to encompass the entire tree, I'm going to go ahead and just see what happens if I take my area of influence, so click on that circle, drag it out, and see what happens. If I want to see the selection that this control point is making, I can go into the show masks checkbox here in the lower right corner, and I can see exactly what the what's being affected and what's not. And just like within Viveza 2, anything that is white has the selection and adjustment on it. Anything that is uh, black or has this color on it is not being affected. And um, anything that is a sort of tone of gray has some of the adjustment on it. If I wanted to clean this up some, like let's say I didn't want any of the effect on uh, some of these leaves that are being affected a little bit, I can place a point, the minus point specifically, uh, into these areas in the background, and I can start to kind of clean those things up. Now, the, my best bet really is to not use massive control points like this. Uh, my best bet is probably to do something more like this. I'm going to delete all of that control point and adjustment. I'm going to place one small point down here, size this area to basically just encompass, you could go really small, but I think in this case we could probably set it to about this size. Uh, and then I'm going to go ahead and warm and uh, remove a little bit of magenta to try to get the tree back to kind of its original color, knowing that the, the tree is in shadow, in shade, so maybe it should be a little bit cool. I'm happy with this result. While I'm on the uh, normal sort of control point or add control point button, I can just go and place another point in here, and this is going to act as a duplicate control point. So now I've basically neutralized my trees, uh, but using smaller control points to kind of make it so that I'm not really affecting these other areas that we don't want affected. So I can, I don't have to place as many minus control points. I'm being a little bit more precise. I'm actually going to drop the saturation down a little. And then, you know what? Let's go into Clearview Plus, increase that just a touch. And then also, I'm going to just brighten these up a little bit. And the beauty of those control points is it makes the selection and therefore we don't have to worry about controlling those other areas. And so now that I've neutralized the tree and we've kind of white balanced more so for the tree or the, the foliage back there, I don't really even need to place control points or maybe not that many to create this color contrast between the, the white and neutral birch tree and then the foliage of the leaves and so on, right? So the, the beauty here is I'm not adding control points to the things that are already saturated and, and boosting that saturation really far. I'm actually kind of minimizing the saturation in certain areas of the image, therefore creating more color contrast between the things that are more neutral and the things that are more saturated. Anyways, it's a good trick to work with. It helps to direct the viewer's attention through an otherwise relatively busy image. Um, and we've got a whole bunch more images to, to work on for this webinar, but I'm afraid we're running out of time. So that said, I'm going to go ahead and jump into our Q&A. If you can't stick around for some reason, uh, you, if you need to head out, uh, feel free. I absolutely appreciate everybody coming out to the webinar today. Hopefully you found this to be a beneficial demonstration. And hopefully maybe it's a little more inspiring or you get to know the software a little bit. Again, if you don't already own the NIC plugins, you can download a 30-day trial. And if you purchase the software, it actually comes with PhotoLab 2 so that you can utilize this same set of tools that we used uh, today. So uh, thank you very much for coming to the webinar. I am going to stick around for a Q&A right now. And so if you've asked questions, stick around so I can answer them for you. Uh, but if you've got to go, thanks so much and have an absolutely fantastic day. All right. I'm going to scroll to the top, ladies and gentlemen, and um, kind of work my way down. I, there's a lot of comments in here. I don't think all of them are questions. So I'm going to try and work relatively quickly uh, to, to make sure that we can get through these. But be patient with me. So Mary from California says, hello. Very cool. Um, is, 
when is Viveza, Viveza going to support 4K computers? So John, great question. Um, right now, PCs, I, and I don't, I couldn't tell you exactly why, but I do know that programming and, and adjusting tools are different for Macs than they are for PCs. Right now, uh, 4K monitors are supported for PCs with the most recent version of the NIC collection. Um, it is not supported on a Mac. They, it will work, right? So you'll, you'll see the Viveza 2 uh, interface on a 4K monitor. It's just the, the tools and the sliders will probably be very small because it's such a high resolution file, or sorry, high resolution uh, monitor. I, I don't know, you know what the ETA is for that, but um, John, I believe that that is something that the, the DxO and Nick Software are working on. Um, let's see. Will this session be recorded? Yes. Luis, this webinar is being recorded and should show up on the Nick Software YouTube page. Basically, all of the webinars that we've been doing, so Photo Joseph and I have been doing webinars for the past few months for Nick Software, at least one or two a week, and uh, we all of the webinars have been posted on the Nick Software YouTube channel, and specifically, I believe, which I'm not sure how it's delineated in that way, but you'll you'll be able to find. Um, oop, what happened? Did my audio cut out. Shoot, hang on. Okay, so it does say we're good to go. Oh, but it switched over from my other Yeti microphone. Let me make sure we're good. Yeah, okay. Nobody seems to be having a problem. I I wonder. I think my audio just shifted. I apologize. It went from my Yeti microphone to my onboard MacBook Pro. Uh, can the area of influence be changed from a keyboard or is it going to be the panel the way you change the size? Um, so to change the size of the area of influence, you, you do have to click on the edge of the control point or on the slider itself and size the slider. There, it would be interesting to be able to use maybe the bracket key or something. Let's see if that works. I don't, I don't believe, I know it does not work in the NIC collection to be able to use like the bracket key, yeah, or a shortcut. You have to actually click on the side of a control point or if you're in the NIC collection specifically, you would um, click on the slider. Good question. Will this work with Photoshop Elements 19? Leo, I believe so. If, so it will work on the most recent version of any of the Adobe products in terms of uh, um, Elements, Photoshop, and Lightroom. And I think you can even use uh, HDRFX Pro from Bridge if you were going to be merging multiple images together. Can the control point adjustment controls be moved outside of the photo? Hmm, no. Todd, interesting question. Outside of the photo being worked on. Well, I think you can click on a control point and drag it outside of the image, but I don't think it actually does anything. No, in fact, at least in PhotoLab, it sticks to the edge. It doesn't let you take it out of the actual image area. Can you make the cursor larger? Yes, Tom, I, I apologize. I actually meant to set my resolution to a different screen resolution before we started, and it totally slipped my mind. So I was trying to tell you exactly where the mouse was going and move relatively slowly. I apologize. I should have resized it. I know better than that. Is there a shortcut, like in Photoshop, to change the size of the viewpoint? I've been using the plugin since Nick was Nick Software itself. Uh, times and sometimes found it difficult to adjust the size. Ashot, yeah, I mean, I think another person actually asked that same question. It would be nice to have a shortcut to be able to resize that area of influence. And then what you'd be able to do as it's being resized is you'd see the adjustment change instantly as well. I think that would be brilliant, really wonderful feature request. Uh, there's quite a bit of lag on this end. Okay, I apologize. So uh, Victor asked earlier, wouldn't a DNG retain more versatility? Technically, yes, Victor. Uh, good question slash comment. It, it would, but if I launch a DNG file from uh, PhotoLab 2 over into Photoshop, it's going to be reprocessed in Adobe Camera Raw. So anything that I would be doing in PhotoLab would likely get thrown out the door, and therefore we would need to, you'd have to redo it in Adobe Camera Raw, and so any of the features that you use in PhotoLab wouldn't, wouldn't be utilized. So that's why we were gonna stick with that TIFF file. Great comment and, and a good find there, like seeing that um, as we were moving from one to the other. Hey, Neil, I remember you, good to see you. Uh, they used to use our images for publications. Yeah, Neil, great to hear from you. Uh, okay, let's see. Dennis, uh, how do you know you have the latest version of the Nick software? 
let's jump over to Photoshop. I can show you. Uh, in, so, Dennis, if you go into any of the Nick plugins, uh, you should be able to kind of get a splash screen, kind of like this. So I moved over into Photoshop. It's the easiest way for me to do this right now. And I click on the word selective tool in this uh, Nick selective tool. And basically it tells me which version we're on. And I'm on version 5.0.2. And actually for DxO, it's it's version 2.0.4. And that's the newest version of the Nick collection. And and so your, your Nick collection should also say Nick collection by DxO. And that would tell you that you're in the newest version as well. Um, Although there's been two versions of the DxO Nick collection versions. Uh, if you don't want the Nick collection to auto show when in Photoshop, how do you prevent the screen from auto opening? Great question as well. So that's in regards to this Nick selective tool. If you don't want the Nick selective tool to automatically pop up when you open Photoshop, you move into the settings. So next time you open Photoshop, move into the settings. And then um, you go into this top setting where it says when Photoshop launches, click on this drop down menu and say do not automatically open the selective tool. So if you don't want it to come up, this is how you'd set that. If you do want your software to come up, or sorry, you do want the Nick selective tool to pop up and it's not coming automatically, what you would do is go up to the file drop down menu, go to automate, go to the Nick selective or Nick collection selective tool. Click on that. And then if you want this Nick selective tool to pop up every time you open Photoshop, um, you go to that top drop down menu and you say automatically open the selective tool. Good comment. Nice question there. Uh, Matthias, cool, joining us from Puerto Rico. Um, James, Nick is not set up for raw conversion with your Fuji GFX. Right. So the Nick collection, the Nick plugins themselves uh, don't and will not process raw files. You, you need to use some sort of raw processing software. And so um, with the, the GFX, which is a brilliant, wonderful camera, I just got my hands on the GFX 100 for a couple weeks. Um, really amazing 100 megapixel camera. Uh, you, you'd need to use a different raw processor for that. In fact, uh, I was in Hawaii. Let's see. Well, you're going to see my, my screen for just a second, my desktop. Uh, I think I've got this Haleakala image. I was in Hawaii and I shot a seven image HDR photograph of the sun rising over Haleakala, which is the, the volcano in Maui. Um, and then this was my result. So I, I actually used uh, HDR FX Pro to create the HDR image. And then I used Viveza 2 to kind of polish the image off. But this is, a, this is from the GFX. Pretty amazing camera. Not fun to carry around for two weeks in Hawaii, but it definitely worth it in the long run. So Lonnie, you said on the first image, Dan was using control points. Uh, you don't have the menu showcasing photo lab. Ah, so Lonnie, if you don't have, if you're in photo lab and you don't have, sorry, let me go back. This option, I, I think you need to update your photo lab. So you, I think this is what you're talking about. You don't have this toolbar down here in the bottom. Um, if that's what you're missing, you just need to get the most recent version of Photolab, uh, in which case, it, if you've got Photolab 2, you just need to update the version that you're on. You might be in Photolab 1, in which case I think you need to upgrade the software. If you're talking about uh, when in local adjustments you don't have these, it just means maybe you, you, weren't in, you weren't actually in the local adjustment section. I'm not sure which you're running into. Um, George, great question. How do you switch back and forth between global and selective editing in um, the Viveza software? What you, let's jump into Viveza here on this image. Uh, basically, you activate a control point to make a selective image processing. Or if you want to make a global adjustment, you just you, you don't click on a control point. So right now, we don't have any control points. But if I add a control point to the image here, place a point there, you see it switches to selective in the upper right corner there. Um, if I simply click anywhere in the image area that's not on the control point, it deactivates that control point. And now I move back and I'm, I'm in global adjustments. Great question. Um, let's see. Okay, we answered that one. Can the area of influence, of, that's a circle, be changed shape um, to be adjusted for an angle? No, Tom, what you would do so the area of influence is going to stay a circle. It's always a circle. Um, you know, that it would be an interesting feature to be able to kind of like 
make that more malleable, make straight edges or something like that for sure. But I, I'm not sure. There'd have, have to be like a pro mode, a pro mode, and then like a, a regular user mode, if you will, um, because I think that that would get really intricate. And if every single control point had those on them, it would get really, it'd be amazing the control that you'd have. But it would get, it would get over, you'd be overburdened with all sorts of things. I don't mean you specifically, but um, you know, it would it would be a lot. So what you would do is you'd use uh, extra control points. Like if I put a point here and I didn't want this point to be affecting up here, I just take another control point, place it up here, size that area of influence, and this acts as a sort of protective control point. Um, all right, so we got that one, got that one. Grouping control points. Yes, we didn't actually talk about grouping control points. So, and by the way, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're we're 10 minutes over. Uh, our time and you've, you've stuck around to hear the answers to these questions. This next question is how do you group and ungroup control points? So say you had like the sky up here. We wanted to control this sky. Obviously you could make one giant control point, but then you run the risk of this point affecting areas that you don't want affected. So what you could do is make smaller control points here where, and I, I don't know how many adjustments I need to make to the sky here, but let's say we darken this down. And I want this same effect over throughout the rest of the um, top of the image. I'm going to go ahead and just duplicate these control points. And then we're going to end up grouping them together. And my, my thought process or technique here is I want to make sure that each of my areas of influence kind of overlap each other. And I tend to, and this is dependent upon the object and the, where we're you know, what we're trying to do, but I tend to actually have my area of influence encompass the previous control point, right? So they're, they're sort of intersecting each other there. And I do that because it kind of guarantees that the software knows what we want to be adjusting. It, it sort of just generates kind of the cleanest selection for me. So I'll just use one more point up here. These are all identical right now, but they're all individual points. So if I affect these sets of sliders, it's just gonna affect this one control point. But what we can do is group these points together by activating all of them. And you can activate control points two different ways. You can either hold the shift key down on your keyboard and click each individual control point, or you can actually just uh, click and drag. So if, if I click anywhere that's not on a control point and drag, it creates this bounding box and I can activate all of those other control points. These are all active control points right now. And I would call this like a one-time group. We haven't actually grouped these together, but in some situations you wouldn't want to group them together. But if I wanted to control them all because they're all active, I can move into one slider of, of one of the control points and it's going to affect all of them at one time. If I wanted to permanently group these control points, and it's not permanent, you can ungroup things as well, but if I wanted to group them so that I can adjust one set of sliders and it will continuously adjust all of the um, uh, other control points, you'd actually click the group button uh, on the right side. So you'd activate all of the control points as we've done and then literally just click the group button. And it groups all of those points together. This is now the master control point you actually see that it's a little bit bigger than the other sort of individual control points. And then it only shows up as one control point here. But if I click on it, now I can see my other sort of um, child control points, right? So if this is the parent control point, then these are the child control points. And then if I go into this set of sliders, I can go ahead and adjust it as we see fit. And it's going to stay grouped until you click on this control point and you click the ungroup button. There is a shortcut for that. To group control points together, you would highlight them all together, like highlight them like we did, and then you can just tap Command-G and that's gonna group them. And if you wanna ungroup them, you can use Shift-Command-G. And I say that because in other pieces of software, in, in the NIC collection, you can use those shortcuts to group and ungroup. Here in Viveza, you can use those shortcuts or you have the buttons to group and ungroup. But in some of the other pieces of software, those buttons don't exist. So the only way to group them is to actually uh, use the shortcut, Command-G to group, Shift-Command-G to ungroup. Ah, John, thank you so much. So John, so somebody asked earlier, um, where were Lisa's, or not Lisa, where were Lori's images shot? And uh, John just mentioned that they're the San Juan Mountains in Colorado. And then I've got another person who said that's Convict Lake. 
uh, let's see here. Okay, so running through these questions still. Uh, how, how do I open Photo Lab 2? You've upgraded to NIC 2. Oh, Charles, good question. So you you upgraded to the NIC Collection 2 yesterday, and you want to be able to open Photo Lab 2. I believe when you installed the NIC Collection, uh, it also installed Photo Lab 2. So in your Applications folder, if you're on a Mac or on your PC, if you if you search for Photo Lab 2. Wherever your applications are stored on your computer, it, it should be stored there. Should be. Now, Charles, if it's not, um, go to the uh, DXO website, and you, you might need to contact them because I'm I am not an expert in in Photo Lab to install and, and uninstalls. But when I installed my Nick software, Nick Collection Two, it literally just installed my um, my Photo Lab, and I was able to go into my applications and find it. Carol, good call. Classic D log E curve. Nice. Uh, so, what's percentage indicates? Oh, yes. Uh, Presley asked the percentage over here. So, in the control points list, what do these percentages mean? Uh, that would be the area of coverage of each control point. So, um, on the right side, next to each of the sort of mask checkboxes, uh, you have a percentage, and that percentage just indicates how big or how small the um, the control point is in relation to the rest of the image. So right now, it's covering 17% of the photo. If I increase it, it's, it's covering 26% of the photo. Doesn't mean it's affecting that much, it just means it's covering that much. Um, I use Nick Collection 2018. The applications appear the same today. Uh, can I just purchase Photo Lab 2 without paying for the Nick collection? That Carol, good question. So Carol has the the Nick collection from 2018, so that that works. Should be you know a recent version of the software. Uh, can you purchase Photo Lab 2? Yes, you can. And to do that, Carol, you you'd go to the DXO specific website as opposed to the Nick collection website. Um, now I think if I go into products, so so Carol, if you're on the Nick website and you go to um, the products drop down menu into photo lab you can uh, basically get an indicator as to how to how to go into the photo lab software and how to purchase that and all of the great features that are built into the software as well hopefully that's helpful um, okay we got that one sorry I'm some of these I've got questions and then other ones are comments so I uh, I don't vocalize all of the comments I just want to make sure that we've got all the questions answered. Fred, thank you so much. You know what, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Uh, I've got a bunch of folks just, you know, say, giving thanks for the webinar. I, I, I love this software. Again, like I'm, I'm kind of a technical photographer, um, but I like to play, you know. And, and this post processing can oftentimes be my playtime. And I love that I don't really have to think about how the tools are working all that much or making intricate selections and things like that. I can just point at the thing, experiment see what happens. If I like it, I keep it. If I don't, I delete it. So I, I love that aspect. Um, there is a brush tool, Thomas. So there's a brush tool when using the Nick collection from Photoshop. You'd click the brush button, and then the brush button is going to allow you to use the um, Nick selective tool. And actually, technically, it's using a layer mask. So if you are familiar with or comfortable with using layer masks in Photoshop, it works basically the same way. And if you're not comfortable, if you're a Photoshop user and you're not comfortable using layers, layer masks, and blending modes, that's your homework. I'm not gonna assign that to you technically because I can't, you're not getting graded, but I would say if you really wanna up your game and you're utilizing the Nick plugins from Photoshop, figure out how they work with layers, utilize layer masks, and figure out blending modes. And uh, you're gonna get so much more out of the Nick collection from Photoshop if you're doing it that way. Um, can they work as smart filters? Yes, all of the Nick collection filters are, or smart, sorry, all of the Nick collection suite will operate as a smart object as well. Um, so what are the big changes between the new version of the NIC and the previous version? So um, Glenn, first of all, the newest version of the NIC collection will work in contemporary operating systems and it will continue to work as the DxO will continue to update the software. Uh, there are 
something like 40 new presets that are called the En Vogue presets that are built into Silver Effects, HDR Effects Pro. They are uh, built into Color Effects Pro and then also Analog Effects Pro. So there are brand new presets that are built in. And I, I actually had the pleasure of generating, creating those presets for DxO. Um, and a lot of those are common things that I use. So if I jump over into Color Effects Pro and into, uh, let's say, the En Vogue section of Color Effects Pro, this image is 100 megapixels, by the way. It's going to take a long, a little while for it to launch. I probably will just click the Cancel button. Um, let's see here. I'll, I'll keep moving as that launches. It's going to take it a minute because it's a giant image and giant phone. So would there be a difference between doing post-processing on the 8-bit image and a 16-bit image? Jenny, great question. Yes, although not always. So it depends upon what you're doing, but a 16-bit per channel file is going to yield you far more information and therefore um, you, you have a lot more sort of leeway to make your adjustments that you might want. So I guess what I'm saying by that is if, if you're in a big hurry and you need to just make a comp to just send off to somebody, um, this, you can work in 8-bit. And, you know, don't let me tell you what you can and can't do, but I, that's when I would suggest using 8-bit. Uh, if, if you want to print the image or if you are concerned because you, you're going to do quite a lot of post-processing on the photograph, an 8-bit file will fall apart. You'll get uh, posterization and you'll get other issues that can occur um, because of artifacting uh, with an 8-bit file that you won't see show up as quickly or as easily with an 8 or 16-bit. So it's, you're better off dealing with the larger file size um, if you're going to save it in perpetuity, right? If it's going to be used for multiple things, uh, or if you're going to do like a lot of image processing. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. So... Lots of comments here. Dan, local adjustment and lower menu. All I can get is right click in the wheel. So Lonnie, I'm sorry to hear that. I would reach out to DxO because that one's above my pay grade in Photo Lab 2. I don't, I don't know that one. So Carol just mentioned I ran out of control points the other day. Uh, is there a limit to the number of control points? Carol, I, I have, can't say that I've run into the limit. I was under the impression that you could get up to like 99 control points in Viveza 2, but I've never found myself needing that many. So if if there is a limit, I, and I haven't done that experiment since literally 2010, so uh, it's been quite a long time. So is there a limit to the number of control points you can use? I guess if, if you've run into that limit, I would say it's probably, um, it has to do with the capability of the, the computer system? Maybe not. Maybe there is an actual number limit. I'm not sure. Uh, is the NIC collection and Photolab separate per, uh, purchases? So there, there are two ways, there are three ways that you can get your hands on Photolab. You can purchase Photolab Essentials, you can purchase Photolab Elite, which comes with some other bells and whistles, and then you can also purchase the NIC collection and when you purchase the NIC collection, it comes with Photo Lab Essentials. It just comes with it. If you want to update or upgrade, rather, to Photo Lab Essentials, you can do that for a nominal, you know, like a, a lesser cost. Um, but good question. I'm, I'm not an expert in the pricing structure in that stuff either. So, uh, you know, take take my recommendations and, and my knowledge base in that regard in as a uh, sort of grain of salt. As a, technically, I. I work for DxO in so much as I do these webinars, but I don't know the ins and outs of all of the uh, cost differences. So I, I'll try and advise, but uh, you know, take it that way. Oh, got it. Okay. So let's see here. I don't. If there are any more questions, go ahead and type them in again. I must have missed something. I. <clears throat> Excuse me. It, it looks like I've answered all the questions, but that that's crazy. Although we're 20 minutes out as well. Wow, we've got, I just want to mention this, 200 people have still stuck around uh, 20 minutes after our proposed ending point here. So thank you so much for, for sticking around for the Q&A here. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. And hopefully that these are actually helpful. 
So one question that did come in, the first image was exported from Photolab into Photoshop before launching into Viveza. How do you return the edited file to Photolab? Good question. So George, because, so I didn't save the file yet. If I went back to this file, oops, I got to cancel out of uh, color effects. I, what I was showing you here is these are the En Vogue recipes that are built into color effects. These are all things that I had been using for quite a bit or quite a while for different image processes, HDR like. This is image that already is in HDR, so we don't need to do that. Although it looks pretty cool. Let's look at that before and after. There's the before, there's the after. I like what it's doing here in the foreground. I would click the OK button, but it would take way too long right now for this to process. As while I'm streaming this stuff, image processing or, or saving out a 100 megapixel file would take too long. So George asked, OK, we did this post-processing here in Photoshop. How do we get it back over into Photolab? What we would do is just save this image. So we could save it as a TIFF file or as a PSD uh, I, or JPEG. I'm going to say OK here. And then, George, what should happen is when we go back into Photolab, the TIFF file should be updated here. So it should just show back up. So here's the original raw file, and then here's that TIFF file that we did the post-processing on. Um, see, I, I have a comment here that's just five question marks, and I don't know what that means. I'm sorry. Uh, the Q&A after party. That's funny. Thanks, Roman. Uh, when copying control points to a new location, if you make adjustments, will they affect the original location when copying a control point to a new location? And if you make adjustments, will they affect the... Hmm. Lewis, that's a complex question. So when we're copying a control point to place it in a new area, the original control point will stay where you put it. So whatever adjustment you made on the original control point is going to stay there. And then uh, the duplicate will have a, an exact duplicate set of adjustments slash will affect wherever you place the control point. So if it's right next to the original control point, you know, it's going to make its own selection kind of in the area of the original area of influence. But if you drag it to the other side of the image, it's going to select that area out. I'm not sure if I answered that one. It's That's a complex question. I think I confused myself. Uh, so Richard, if you export a DNG to Lightroom, I believe there's no reprocessing. Agree, thanks for another wonderful webinar. Let's see what happens, Richard. I'm pretty sure if I, let's say we take this image and I export it to an application and we export this image as a DNG file as opposed to um, as opposed to a TIFF file, we do this over to Photoshop, I think what's gonna happen is Adobe Camera Raw is going to launch over in Photoshop and the uh, result it doesn't even take it right now. That's weird. I think what it wants to do is open Adobe Camera Raw if you were to do that. Oh, no, it's not done. Sorry, the progress bar was 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 en route. Yeah, so, so what's happening here is uh, the image is opened into Adobe Camera Raw. Interesting, though, it looks like my adjustments are, are, are on there, but I can't adjust that. So let's, this is, this is a really, Richard, um, you know, cool experiment that you sort of brought up here. Okay, I'm gonna just just throw this whole image off, right, just to see what happens. So, uh, because I wanna be able to see if this is going to export this image to Photoshop's Adobe Camera Raw um, with this weird white balance just adjustment or whatever else I did. Because of it, oh, it already wants, it already knows there's one open. Uh, so I'm gonna say use unique name. Let's see what happens. It's gonna take it a second. It could be a really interesting process, Richard, to do the post, you know, use uh, Photolab 2 here as the, the raw processor, send it over into a camera raw, use whatever other tools maybe you want to use in there, and then go into, yeah, it did. How interesting. Richard, great call. So what, what we just found that is that if you make adjustments in Photolab 2, do, that, do whatever post-processing you want, and then you send it into Photoshop, export it as a DNG into Photoshop, you will have the adjustments that you've made within uh, Adobe Camera Raw, no, sorry, in Photolab, reflected in your image here. Definitely interesting. That actually opens up some other potential kind of workflows as well. 
good eye. All right. Uh, one last question. Only have one version of Nick in the application folder. So why do I get two Nick layers when I return to Photoshop? Uh, I don't see, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm not exactly following. Why do you get two? So if you're in Photoshop, the way that this stuff works is that the background is your original set of layers and then your original set of layers are, are duplicated and you have adjustments made on top of that. And so you would, this is a benefit typically, although the, the file size gets bigger. Um, this is a benefit because you can go back and change things pretty easily, or you can use Photoshop with these layers of pixels with blending modes and smart objects and um, layer masks and so on and so forth. Cool. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, 11.30 here. You've stuck around quite a while. I greatly appreciate that. Hopefully the Q&A is as helpful as the actual webinar is. Um, thank you so much for coming out. I hope to be doing some more webinars probably this, this coming November. Uh, have an absolutely wonderful day. Enjoy the software. Get out there, make some fall foliage images, uh, and um, enjoy. Thanks a lot, ladies and gentlemen.